what we're going to talk about is how to take simplicity and use it to clean up your thoughts and to use it with your mindset. So this workshop today, we're going to talk about how you can change the way you think about your your self your self talk. So how you talk to yourself. What are the thoughts that are going through your mind? Are the thoughts empowering, encouraging words that you would speak to a child wanting to walk for the very first time? Or are the thoughts going through your mind negative, belittling words that you would spew to an enemy? And so if you really think about that, like what are the thoughts that are going through your mind? How are you speaking to yourself? So today we want to talk about the self-limiting beliefs and behaviors that are holding you back and keeping you stuck, and the questions that can set you free. And so if you can change the way you think, you can master a new way to be. So before we dive too deep, I want you all to take a second and get out your pen and paper, or however you're taking notes. And I want you to think about a thought that's been going on in the back of your head, a thought that's been stressing you out, a thought that's been causing you some anxiety, a thought that's been keeping you up at night. So this thought can be about you, it can be about somebody else, it can be about a situation. Just go ahead and take a second and write down this thought that you've been having. Yeah, it really could be anything at all. Anything that you, you know is getting in your way. Something silent that you think repeat yourself. And you're not going to share it with anyone. Yeah, unless this, you want this to. is just for you. Yeah, so this is not, we're not going to start asking you to read them here. Um, to piggyback off of that, you know, I want to give a little bit more background on you know the idea of our self-limiting behaviors and be, be, uh, beliefs and behaviors, and share a quick story, a quick success story that we heard recently about one of our older coaching clients that we worked with several years ago. Um, recently, told us a success story that just blew me away. Um, he found himself in a uh, grocery aisle behind a. Well, he only had two items in his hand, so he was trying to get in and out. You know, and we all sort of been there. And he found himself in, in a lane where there was a woman in front of him who had just a giant pile of groceries and a little child sitting in, in the front of the cart. And it was the only lane open in the grocery store. And so we walked into, up to the situation and immediately he was like, oh, he was tense. He was upset to be there, you know? Um, and as, as he sat there and they got closer, the woman uh, literally was gooing and gawing over the baby and started, started talking to the store clerk. And they were laughing. And then the store clerk was gooing and gawing over the baby. And the woman actually handed the baby over to the woman. <laughs> and the two of them were just sitting there and smiling. And you can imagine this. I mean, he is just getting irate on the inside. He is about to burst. The, the cluttered thoughts in the back of his head were about to spew out of him. Um, but he, he, he sort of caught himself in the act. He really took a deep breath. And he thought about, he went through some of the, some of the self-inquiry uh, tools that we're going to talk to you guys about today. But he caught himself, he closed his eyes, he took that deep breath, he thought about it. He opened his eyes again and he said, okay, you know, this little girl really is cute. This, is, this isn't a terrible situation. And he patiently waited and naturally the woman and the child left. And he got up to the store clerk and he said, you know, that little girl really is adorable. And the store clerk looked at him and said, well, thank you, sir. That's actually my daughter. Uh, my husband died in Afghanistan a couple years ago, and my sister who works from home watches my daughter and helps me kind of get through, okay? And our, our client was a retired, pretty high-ranking officer in the military. So he had the utmost respect for military families and what they go through. And here it was, the, the clutter, the negativity in the back of his head was about to spew out it at him and, and insult and disrespect somebody who he would never, ever want to insult or disrespect. So that's a perfect example, it's an extreme example, but a perfect example, like when he told me that story, I was like, oh my God, you know, it gave me goosebumps. It really yeah. gave me the chills. Every, every time I think about it, it gives me chills. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's a reminder to all of us that the way we choose to respond truly has an impact on the way we live and the actions, the, the impact we have on the world, right? And like this moment right here, right now, could be the greatest time of our lives. This could be the beginning of the time where we felt the best, where we've acted the most positive, taken the most positive action. And the reason I know that that's true is the cliche that every moment is a new beginning, right? We say it's a cliche, but 
Every day, every moment a baby is born, every moment life begins, right? And we're, we're constantly dealing with this changing playing field of what reality is, what the, what the present moment is. And a lot of times we're attached to what happened in the past and the way we felt, our expectations going into a situation, what we think might happen or what should happen, right? Instead of just being there and responding mindfully to the situation at hand, okay? And you have to understand, if you try to do the wrong, like even, even if you're doing the right thing, even if you're trying to be positive, if you're trying to do the right thing, i.e. something that worked in the past, and you're trying to do it now, and you have the expectation that it's going to work out the same way, it doesn't always do that. So you try to do the right thing at the wrong time, and you get frustration. You don't get pleasure, you don't get peace of mind, you get frustration. You're entering the present with the expectation that things are going to be the way they were. Right? So in order to, to, to be the best you can be in the present moment, you've got to change your state of mind. You've really got to change your state of mind. Now, how quickly can you change your state of mind? That, that reminds me of the color exercise. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. That okay. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's actually perfect. I want you to look around this room right now. Okay? Look around this room, and I want you to look for the color red. Okay? Look left, look right, up, down, around. Look for the color red. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about all the places that you see the color green. <laughs> kind of tough, huh? Okay, open your eyes. No tricks this time. I really want you to look for green. Look around the room and look for green. Look for green. Okay? You got it? Okay? Close your eyes. Now raise your hand if you can see a lot more green this time. Uh-huh. Of course, right? Why is that? Seek and you shall find, right? What you focus on, you're going to see more of in your life. And I bet some of you guys actually saw maybe a little lime green, maybe a little turquoise, and you sold yourself on the idea that that was green, right? You sold yourself on that, that's green. Because you were focused on being positive about it. You were focused on, okay, I'm looking for this in my life. So you're going to see more of it even when it's not even there. A lot of times it's the thoughts, right? It's the, it's the questions and the thoughts that are going on in the back of our head that prevent us from actually seeing that positive, right? If, if we're in a situation like in that grocery line and we're thinking, why me? Like, why am I here, right? Why am I stuck here? What does that do to your mindset, right? Or if you're on the way to the gym and you're, instead of thinking about getting a workout done, you're thinking, why am I so flabby, right? And you're, 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 getting, you're on your way to the gym with that thought process in your head. A lot of times you're going to turn right back around and go back home because, yeah, why, why am I? You know? I mean, if you ask a question like that, like, you know, why me? You know, life can answer because, because that's just the way it is. Why am I flabby? Because you are. There is no positive answer to a negative question. If you're always asking yourself negative questions, you're always going to get an answer you don't like. That is the truth. So an easy way to switch this around before we get into the formal self-inquiry process, an easy way would just be to twist that question around, right? Why not me? Why not me and why not now? Right? Why am I good enough to get up and get to that gym and get that workout done? Like that's a question that's going to empower you to get things done. Right? You can also think about the thing, what about the things that, that, that motivate you? If you're in a tough situation. You don't necessarily want to be where you are in the moment. But you think about, you know, if you wanted to be grateful for it right now, you wanted to be grateful, not, oh, I don't want to be grateful, I'm not into the mood, in the mood for that, but if you wanted to be grateful, what could you be grateful for right now? Right? Certainly things aren't perfect, but there are things that we have to be grateful for. Right? What could you be happy about right now if you wanted to be happy? Not if you didn't want to be happy and you want to think negative, but if you actually focus on being happy, what could you be happy about? What could you get excited about right now? Right? A lot of times we have nine to five jobs that maybe we don't like, that we'd love to exit real quick out of. But the reality is we have bills, we have family, we have things that we, are, we are, have responsibilities in our lives. So it, when we think about what am I excited about right now, we're like, oh God, you know, what's in my mind is I, I want to get out of this job and I'm, I'm stuck here. But the question is, is, what are you excited about that that job allows you to do? It allows you to feed your family. It allows you to provide great vacations for, for people you love, right? It allows you to do certain things. And it's not that you shouldn't take steps, slow, gradual steps to move from point A to point B, but in a moment, in that particular moment, 
you actually do have something to be excited about. And oftentimes we overlook that. And, it's and a, shame. a good activity to actually do is when you're when you're feeling great, when you're in a good mood, even even after after today's event, is to take a moment and write down the things that you are grateful for. So when you do have those down moments, you're able to reference that list and you're able to remind yourself because we're so good when we're, when we're down or stressed and we're tense, we're so good at forgetting all the good stuff. We're so good at just overlooking all that. Nothing good is going on in my life right now. Yeah. So I challenge you to actually write yourself a letter with the things that you are grateful for. And Mark's actually done this activity. Yeah, no, I, I have. You know, I, 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 affirmations, I mean, that's what it really is. is you know, the, the, the positive questions we can ask ourselves, you know, affirmations sometimes are thought of as a cliche, too, because they're so frequently mentioned, and it's like, oh, affirmations aren't going to help me. But the truth is, what is an affirmation? It's just a positive statement or a positive question or a positive thought that you're keeping in a place easily accessible at the top of your mind. So when you're struggling a little bit, it's right there, right? That's what it's all about. It's right there at the top of your head. So, I mean, a perfect example of this would be, I wear this band here, and it says, fight like a girl. And, and uh, it's kind of funny, right? But Angel's best friend um, was diagnosed with breast cancer a couple years ago. And luckily, she's gone through radiation. She's gone through uh, the chemo. And she's, her, her cancer is in remission. But she handed out this, this fight like a girl. Like, I'm going to fight like a girl. I'm going to fight to get through this cancer. She handed out this out to all of her uh, friends and family. She wanted us to get behind her with that affirmation that I can fight. I can get through this. Right? And this was popularized by Lance Armstrong. Right, with his Live Strong campaign. He would, you know, he was pedaling up a steep mountain in the French Alps or something. He flipped that wristband from one hand to the next, and it said, Live Strong. And he said, all right, Live Strong, I can get through this. It's not a brand, it's an affirmation. And those affirmations are extremely important. The thoughts, the questions, what we're asking ourselves gets us through. So, it, it, you know, another famous example would be Muhammad Ali. What was Muhammad Ali's a affirmation? Anybody know? I'm the greatest. I am the greatest, right. I am the greatest. Who else was going to tell him that? <laughs> Who else was going to tell you that? Like, sadly, sadly, there are hundreds, if not thousands of people in this world for their own personal reasons that are going to spew negativity your way. It's nothing personal, but they have their own things going on, and they're going to say things that are going to kind of defeat you, right? They're going to tell you your ideas aren't great. They're going to... They're going to get the best of you with, with certain comments. If the idea here is that you don't have to be one of those people. You definitely do not have to be one of those people. And so to Angel's remark about you know, writing, writing yourself a letter, um, yeah, a couple years ago on a day when I was feeling great, when I was feeling like on the top of the world, some of my ideas that I was working on and the products we were working on really hit big. I sat down and I wrote myself a letter. It's about a two-page letter. There's about 30 bullet points in that, in that letter. And it was about things that I was like really, really happy about. Ideas and accomplishments that empowered me. You know, one of them is as simple as I married the right woman. Right? I graduated from a university. I had the goal of graduating from a good university. I got my degree. Something I did when I was young. I was really proud of that, you know, at that time. And I still am. Um, I started a business in my 20s. And now that I'm in my mid-30s, Angel and I are able to work on it full-time together. I'm really proud of that. I have a healthy young son. I'm extremely proud of that. But on a day when my ideas don't work, on a day when I'm feeling down in the dumps, like all of us get someplace, when we're just feeling down and defeated, I forget all of that stuff. And so I have a letter that I wrote to myself to reference on a day when I need it the most. And it's a tool I highly recommend you guys do. It's so simple, but it's usually the simple things that have the most profound impact. It really is. And we all get our minds stuck in the gutter. None of us are immune to this. Um, so we've got to remember that too. So we're all guilty of it. Um, it's a matter of not succumbing to those thoughts. So whether your negative thinking is a common occurrence or a every now and then incident, it's critical for our long-term happiness that we're able to recognize when we're being negative or when those negative thoughts are coming across and how to then take those negative thoughts and change them to positive thoughts. So as in the example of our coaching client, he was able to recognize on the fly, like, holy moly, I'm starting to have these thoughts. I'm getting ready to burst. He was able to recognize that, take a second, and then move forward in a positive direction. And so 
what we want to do is it's ultimately our thoughts that are hurting us. And so right now we want to introduce the process of self-inquiry. And that's going to be you, a series of questions that you're going to ask yourself based on the thoughts that you are having. Right. If you were to go to a counselor or a coach or a therapist or whatever, the, the, the general practice is you would go into their office, you would sit down, they would ask you a series of questions, they would record everything you say, you'd go back later that week or next week and they reiterate some of what you said to them, they give you their opinion and, and they'd ask you another series of questions and generally they help you sort out your thoughts. I mean, that's what they do. They record your thoughts and they help you sort things out in your life. And so, yeah, self-inquiry, the tool of self-inquiry is something that allows you to do that for yourself. It allows you to record your thoughts when you're having, an, like, when you're feeling emotional. Can you want me to, can I step into this? Or do you yeah, want to yeah. Okay. So right now, we're kind of forcing the activity because we want you to think about your yeah. thought right now as we're going through these questions. But if you were to do this on your own, which I hope you do in the future, is when you're feeling emotional, when you're feel, feeling anxiety, I want you to write those thoughts down right there in the moment. So step away, take a minute, and write down the thoughts you're feeling. Because we're so good at, an hour later, a couple hours later, we're so good at looking back and it's like, oh, it wasn't that bad. I was exaggerating, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. When in that moment, the world was coming to an end. Right. It was so, affecting the way you communicated with people. It was affecting, I and mean, even the smallest thing, like, oh, I'm not good enough right now, is that's affecting the way you communicate. That's affecting the way you behave, the way you treat yourself, the way you treat others. So even though later on it might seem like, oh, that little bit of negativity wasn't that big of a deal, in that moment, mm -hmm. it was a huge deal. Your effectiveness went yeah, right so, down. So we want you to write down these thoughts when you're feeling emotional. So take a second, step away, and write them down. And do it doesn't a, have to be long. It's like a brain dump. No. Like really get like a, well, like maybe, maybe a paragraph. Yeah. Maybe a few sentences. Just like, write like you feel that anxiety building. Point. Just right. get it on the paper. You feel the anxiety building and the idea is, okay, let me take a quick second, take a breather here. And rather than, you know, try to close my eyes and relax, let me just write down whatever it is that's bothering me in that moment. So that it's recorded in a safe place. So that later on, you can go back and apply the self to it. Yeah. So then... When you're in a better place, whether it's a couple hours later or even a couple days later, when you're feeling good, when you're in a good place, then you're going to go back to this thought, you're going to read it, and then you're going to ask yourself these series of questions that we're going to go over right now. So while I'm going over these questions, I want you to think about how they relate to your thought that you wrote down. So question number one, is it true? Is this thought 100% true? And can it be proven? So when, as you read your thought, right, I mean, just read, simply, when you, if you're in an emotional state of mind and you record a, a truly emotional thought down, and you go back later when you're feeling calm and collected, whether it's a day later or a week later, and you read that, it's probably going to make you feel a certain way, just naturally looking at that, if, you, if you've been completely honest with yourself. And you then you ask yourself a question, like, is it true? Well, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to this. This isn't about proving yourself wrong or proving yourself right. It's about picking that thought up and looking at it from a different perspective. It's about really twisting it around. You know, can this be proven? Like, could this, I'm not good enough for that. Could that be scientifically proven? <laughs> right? It's not, I mean, it, it's not necessarily right or wrong, but it's like, well, what, what else is true? Right? So it, it, it's about looking at your thought a little bit more not necessarily optimistically, but just looking at the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Taking time to mindfully think about that rather than just when you were in that moment and you, you were letting it get the best of you. Yep. And so question number two, how, how do I feel when I think this thought? How does this thought make me treat myself? How do I treat others when I think this thought? How do I treat the situation when I think this thought? Right. Who am I with that thought in my head? And question number three, who would I be without this thought? How would I treat myself if I didn't think this thought? Right. What else would I see if I wasn't thinking that thought? Because that's a big one, right? Like when, when we're focused, when we're so narrowly focused on something that's negative or just so narrowly focused on that, 
we're missing everything in the periphery. There's a lot of other things going on. A great example would be, let's say you, you had a conversation with someone two years ago and they said something that upset you. And now two years have passed, but every time you interact with that person, you think of that person as the person who said that thing to you. They've had children since then. The world has turned many times. They could be totally different. You're both totally different. The situation is completely different. But every time you step into a conversation with them, the first thing you think about is, oh, that's who that person is, mm -hmm. right? What does that do to the conversation? Immediately, right? Let me, let me give you a personal example. So I have a younger sister, and she used to live about a mile away from me. And I used to think my sister was the most selfish person in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> works. Okay? She's the most selfish person. So when I go through these questions based on that thought, so question number one, is it true? Heck yeah, it's true. She's the most selfish person. <laughs> it's always her way or the highway. She's always, you know, leaving her schedule open. She, she can't commit to me because something better may come up. And so, yeah, I can think of a million examples on why my sister is the most selfish person in the world. Can it be proven? I don't know, but it's true. <laughs> it's true. Um, so question number two, how does this thought make me feel? How do I treat my sister when I have this thought? Well, when my sister's around, I'm immediately agitated. I'm stressed. I'm tense. I'm not happy. I just, I know it's going to be her way. I, I just, it just doesn't make me, it's not me. It doesn't make me the person that I want to be. And I feel it. I, the second I know she's coming over or that we're making plans together, it just makes me angry. And I feel it and it just overtakes me. And so the third question, who would I be without this thought? So if I remove the thought that my sister is selfish, who do I see? So if I remove the thought that my sister is selfish, all of a sudden I see this beautiful, caring person who is extremely thoughtful, who's fun, who's loving, who has great ideas. And I realize like that, that third question can be extremely powerful. So I was letting that thought that my sister is selfish overshadow all the positive qualities that she has to offer. And like Mark had mentioned, yeah, maybe she was selfish. Maybe two years ago, she was very selfish. Maybe okay. she's selfish sometimes even now. Like, we all are, right? <laughs> all of us are selfish sometimes. But, but we're all, I, that's all we focus on. That's all we see. Mm -hmm. There's all this other stuff that's going on. Yeah. I was attaching that to her. And it, it wasn't necessarily her fault. And she may have not even known that I was having that thought. But I was so tense inside. I was taking over. So I was letting that thought overshadow all the good times all the positive qualities that she had to offer. Yeah, and it, you know, I think another, another tool you can use with the self-inquiry is to kind of reverse the initial thought on yourself. So, you know, I use the example of like, I'm not good enough, right? Like, I'm not good enough for them. And we, 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 we've gone through the questions, you know, is, is, this a, is this something that can be proven? Who, who, who am I with that thought in my head? How would I feel if we remove the thought? But then you can actually reverse it. So like, one reversal for I'm not good enough for them would be they're not good enough for me. So it's not necessarily right or wrong, but is that at least equally as true? What, what am I great at? In what way am I good enough, right? But then there's an even more powerful one there. There's a I'm not good enough for me, which is a common one, right? Like, is it me that's judging myself here that's the problem? Mm -hmm. So, once again, not a right or wrong. It doesn't give you a clear road to like a, a big solution, but it's let me take a look at my thoughts and let me twist them around on myself and take a look at the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. And even to use those, the turnarounds on my example, so the opposite of my sister is selfish would be my sister is caring. Mm -hmm. Can I think of examples on how my sister is caring? Yeah, she gives the most thoughtful gifts She's not the person that's going to the store and buying you gifts on the way to the party. She's putting thought into it a month in advance and giving you something that you're like, oh my gosh, this is perfect, thank you so much. And another, another opposite of the thought my sister is selfish would be, I am selfish. So that got me thinking. 
am I the one that's being selfish this whole time? And I, am I the one that's getting upset because we're not doing the things that I want to do? And like Mark mentioned, it's not black and white. It's not, okay, yes, I'm the selfish person. But it's just giving you a new perspective on that thought. It's opening the doors and the windows and being like, okay, maybe my initial thought, maybe there are different ways to look at this situation, different ways to look at this thought. And this ties into mindfulness, right? This ties into being more mindful about your thoughts, what's going on in your head. And Angel and I define mindfulness as like being right here, right now, without wishing it were any different than it is. Appreciating the good things without holding on so tight when they change, because they will eventually change. And dealing with the struggles, right? Dealing with the negativity, dealing with the struggles as they arise, without fearing that it will, it will always be that way. Because it won't. Everything's changing, right? It's a new beginning. So, and this ties into the idea of, of the self-inquiry. That's what it's helping you do. It's helping you sort these thoughts out. Now, this isn't happening in real time, at least not initially. Initially, when you're feeling the anxiety, you're doing the recording. You're doing that brain dump. And then you're going back later when you're feeling calm and collected, and you're going back through your thoughts. Mm-hmm. But it, it, All day, we're talking silently to ourselves. So all day, we have these thoughts going on in the back of our mind, and part of us believes that it's true. So to conquer those thoughts and to clean them out, to simplify them, we have to be more mindful and more present. Yeah, no, no question about it. And so it's about, like, like I said, it's about building the ritual of doing this. You know, so you're not going to be able to be mindful immediately with these kinds of negative thoughts that are going on in your head. You're not going to be able to sort them out instantaneously. Going through this process once isn't going to fix you, right? But if you build the ritual, if you literally, every time you're feeling that anxiety, you find yourself at 60 seconds to do that brain dump, and then on a consistent basis, twice, three times a week, you go back and make yourself the time to go back through those thoughts, that process is gonna become part of your identity. It's gonna slowly become a part of who you are. And you're going to actually be able to catch yourself like our client did in that grocery line. Oh wow, let me think about this real quick, right? I mean, is this really true? How is this thought making me behave and feel? Who am I, you know, without this thought in my head? Okay, you know, and it's not, you're not gonna be able to do that on the fly and be able to catch yourself immediately, but you get into the ritual of doing this, and that's how the big change happens over time. And Charlie talked a lot about goals yesterday, and so what we wanna emphasize is the ritual. What are the steps that you need to take to get to that goal? And so an example of this would be a sports team, a basketball team. They want to win a championship game. So the goal is that they're going to win the championship. So what's the ritual that's going to get them to the championship game? Practice. So the ritual is that they are going to practice every single day. They're going to dribble. They're going to do free throws. They're going to work as a team. They're going to practice. So that is the ritual. You can also think of it as a habit. But that's the ritual. And now if you actually took away the goal, took away the goal completely, Forget about the goal, because sometimes the goal is so overarching that it stalls you more than propels you. So if you forget about the goal completely and just do the ritual, you'll probably get pretty close to that goal, if not achieve it, just by doing the ritual. Right. Yeah, the ritual is the ritual is the key. Thinking about the goal of like I want to, I don't want to have any of this negativity in the back of my head, right? That, that goal is like, well, how are we going to do that? But the ritual of implementing something like self inquiry. Something like positive affirmation consistently is what gets you there, right? You never know, like when our, when our client was in line at the grocery store, like I could use an analogy and say like being in the gym, right? Being in the gym, I don't know when I'm in the gym, I don't know when I'm gonna be feeling good enough to hit one of my personal best records, right? It's almost like anybody who works out sort of knows that, an athlete knows that you just don't know. Some days you just have something, right? So I can't necessarily plan that goal, like I'm gonna hit a best record today. But what I can do is I can have the ritual of being in that gym consistently so that I'm there on the day where I hit that personal best record. And so it's the same thing with mindfulness, right? It's the same. If he, that if he wasn't constantly practicing, then when he was in line, he wouldn't be able to catch himself. It's the same thing. It's about the ritual. It's about making this a bigger part of who you are as an individual. And we can tap in a little bit on what are some ways to be more present and more mindful through different types of meditation. 
that you can do. I know we talked about that a little bit, but there are three different types of meditation that you can tap into depending on which one suits your needs and which one you're attracted to more. Yeah, I mean, there are many types of meditation, but the three we constantly practice. Um, a lot of them I touched on quickly when I got up here, and, and I, I, you know, I said, you know, every morning we start our morning off with a 15-minute meditation, just to center our mind. So that really is just a stress reduction meditation, sitting in a chair, eyes closed, focusing on the breath, right, in and out, focusing on the breath, and any time a thought creeps up in our head, we start thinking about it. Oh, well, there's a thought. We don't judge it. We just bring the attention back to the breath. And that's it, and that's 15 minutes. Um, a, a quick way to do this if you're in an office and you're feeling like, oh my God, this is a stressful day and I just need a quick 60 seconds to like recoup, a, a quick body scan, literally close your eyes and you know, start at your toes and think about your body. How does it feel? And kind of travel up you know, into your torso. How does it feel to be here in me right now? And just literally go through every like, part of your body and it takes 60 seconds. And that can just help center you. It just helps, like, here I am, here I am, I'm me. And how does it feel to be inside me? Um, gratitude, you know, we, we touched on gratitude, but gratitude is another big one that I practice consistently. Several years ago, I got really into reading tons of positive psychology books. We went through a ton of them. And one thing that comes up in, in those is that it's been scientifically proven that if you focus on the things you're grateful for, you actually are more grateful. So like, there was like studies where they had two, two groups. Uh, one was just a focus group, and the other one, every day they had people record three things that they were grateful for before they went to bed. And they went back after, after six months, and the people who were doing that were measurably happier. And there are several studies that have shown that. So that's like gratitude journaling. You can do the same thing with meditation. Close your eyes go through three or four things that you were grateful for the, for the day. It doesn't have to be big. Small wins. I'm grateful my wife and child came home safely to me tonight. Boom, that's number one, right? So, but doing that consistently, making the ritual of that every single day has profound effects and it's been scientifically proven. Mm -hmm. And uh, another way that I've found for myself that helps me be more present is actually having some time for myself, having that time that quietness just for myself and with a toddler it's tough <laughs> i can tell you that so um and many of you already know this but one way that i found that is helpful for me is i actually get up an hour early so i get up an hour earlier before anyone else in the house so my son wakes up anytime between 6 a.m and 7 a.m so i know that my alarm is set for 5 a.m and it sounds early but getting up at 5 a.m and having that slow calm start makes all of the difference in my day. I'm able to get up, I'm able to drink my glass of water, I'm able to sit down quietly and do my meditation, and then when Matt gets up, my son, then I'm, re I'm already up. I I'm not going up there groggy, I I'm up, I'm ready, I'm ready to start the day. And so that has made a world of difference um, in me being present and mindful and having that slow, easy start in the morning. And if you ever want to be a little bit more present, watch a child or look at your pet. You know, they're not thinking about the past. They're not thinking about the future. They're in that moment. Whether they're happy or sad, they're in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think the interesting thing to say about that too, which I know we touched on the webinar, is that when you're talking about presence, when you're talking about like being here, doing the body scan, like let's come to the present moment, it's not to like, Oh, here I am in the present moment, and oh, it's so wonderful. It's not to sit in there like indefinitely, right? You bring yourself because the, the 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 argument against that, like the type A personality, where like I've got things to do, right? To be present and just to accept the present moment as it is, it means like oh, you're not getting anything else done. So it's not that you sit in that present moment forever. You're collecting yourself. You're getting extremely focused, putting your energy on the present so that then you can take a step forward and be the most effective you possibly can be because you're all there, right? So that's what it's about. Mindfulness, becoming mindful, becoming present, isn't about getting there and then sitting there. It's about getting there, collecting yourself, and then taking focused action on those goals, carrying out through rituals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then one last thing I want to tap on is accountability. A lot of us are here today and you know we're going to hold each other accountable that's part of the fun um where's the gentleman that posted the picture last night on the facebook page of decluttering some things um that's great because that's accountability he said he was going to do it therefore he went home 
He did it, and then he took a picture because he wanted to prove it. So another thing that worked very well is having an accountability partner to keep you on track. And a tactic that you can use, instead of having someone call you up and say, hey, are you doing this, this, and that? Did you do it? Instead of me calling him up and say, hey, did you declutter last night? What you can do is you can write down the things that you want to accomplish. Write down the questions that you want your accountability partner to ask you. So therefore, they're not nagging you. They're simply asking you the questions that you ask them to ask you. Right. It's amazing how this, this tool we've used with coaching clients for a while, it's amazing how effective it is. It's so darn simple. It's like the don't break the chain thing for a ritual, right? Which is every time you're done for the day, put a little X on the calendar. Seems so simple, but when the human mind sees all those X's in a row, it motivates us not to break the chain. And this is the same thing. It's, it's a simple ritual of you are writing yourself, let's say, 10 questions, like question number one for me. Did I spend an hour, at least an hour today with my son playing? That's one for personal, right? Did I, did, did I spend two hours today writing? Like those are my questions, right? And if I had 10 of them, and I gave those questions to Angel, or I just gave them to a friend, right? And the friend called me up, once a day and ask me those 10 questions. They're not bad for me, they're bad for me, they're my questions, right? These are my questions. They're just simply asking me the questions and for every one that I can say yes to, I put a one next to. And the idea is to get 10, right? The idea is to get a perfect 10. And you do the same thing, you do that for each other. And that's another one, scientifically proven. You give people a bunch of things they want to accomplish that they're excited about and no one ever checks up on them. And you give the same, yeah, another people, same exact situation. The only difference is they have accountability partners that are calling them every single day. I mean, I don't remember what percentages they are, but like, once again, measurably more successful on that end. Well, so it's, you, that, it's that whole saying too, you have to inspect what you expect. Right. So if you expect you're going to hit these goals and you're not inspecting yourself, you're not having someone check up on you, are you really doing it? Or is it this idea that's just out there? Right. So you have to inspect what you expect. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all we got for you guys. If you guys have questions, we'd love to field them. That would be our honor to do that. Do sure. you think there are any positive negative thought? Like, it, like when I have like a really down period, it seems like priorities become way clearer. Give me, give me an example. That's interesting. <laughs> so usually, like, say I'm trying a new habit. It, it usually the spark is that I was in a really down period before. So it's like, oh man, I gotta get back to what was working for me before. I gotta exercise, I gotta eat right, that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the idea with that though is not putting too much on your plate. So I, I think that's a mistake that a lot of people make. Um, it gets negative when you feel like you have too much, right? And so one thing I love to say is that you know, when you wake up in the morning, start with a clean plate and figure out like what are the items that I need to have on my plate today. Um, it's easier for entrepreneurs. It's a little harder for people who are in like a you know Fortune 500 situation or like got like emails and things flying at them. But the idea is is if you have a list of 25 things you'd love to accomplish today, right? You're never going to get them done. Or if you, if you somehow do, they're never going to be done effectively. So really, I mean, for us, it's about waking up every morning, cleaning the plate, and saying, okay, what would I like to put back on my plate today? What needs to get done? And sometimes you're going to have to break commitments with people. You're going to have to like, you're going to have to shift some things, and, and you, you have to do that mindfully. You have to be cordial about that. But having, for me, Angel and I have determined that it's like three to five things, three to five core things a day. That's it, right? Any more than that, you're not going to do it effectively. And I don't, when I say core things, I don't mean like grocery shopping, picking the kids up from school, tying your shoelaces, right? Like, hopefully, like, some, some, of, some of that stuff, hopefully you can bash together, right? You'll have a morning routine where you get those shoes tied in. You can pick up groceries on the way back from dropping the kids off at school, something like that, you know? Those are small, like, you know, menial tasks. But the core things, like, like the, my, me writing 500 words a day, that's one of my core tasks. I don't want to have more than five of those, preferably not more than three. Anything else? Questions? All right. Well, thank you. Oh, well, I guess another one. Oh, man, you're hogging all the time. <laughs> Do you find that like, you need solitude to kind of build this sort of positive mindset because otherwise you're racing place to place and you have like, these influences of others? Absolutely. That's what, that's what the morning meditation is all about. Yeah. It's not starting the day in that healthy, <coughs> skeptical, busy mindset. Without a doubt, we need that space. 
it, it, you know, I mean, one, that's one of the reasons I started getting up early. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, I was I was getting up and it was just go, 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 you know, it was a mad rush from the second I heard the baby monitor going off. So I needed that personal space. I needed that quietness. So yes, I think, you know, boycott business. That's Courtney. Yeah, boycott business, exactly. <laughs> you know, I bet it goes ties right into, once again, not having more than like kind of five or four things you're working on, because if you have more than that, you're not leaving yourself enough space between everything, right? And the idea is to have that kind of that, that, that soft area to land just in case something takes a little bit longer, right? Just in case something comes up because the things will blindside you, right? There's gonna be events that you need to address. You know, it's like, like my example, the, the, the milk spilling out of the refrigerator, right? I mean, that's something you can't anticipate, but if you, if you go into it not feeling like you have enough time, you're going to address that situation in a very stressful, angry way. But if you have enough space built in where you're saying, I'm not stacking everything so close that I'm barely making it, then you have enough time to address your son or daughter, clean up the mess, do it over again, and have a great experience. So it's about leaving yourself those margins, without a doubt. Go. Okay, it's not really a question, it's a, oh, it's not a question, it's a comment more. But I was going to say, um, when you mentioned about your selfish sister, I have a selfish brother, so I don't know. But the way I kind of dealt with it in my head where I was like, um, and a few of us here talked about labelling and how it makes us feel or whatever, but I realised that it wasn't that my brother is selfish, it's that he does selfish actions, like, quite a lot, you know, quite often, <laughs> but we all do, so I guess for me it was like, is he really selfish, or does it just, he does selfish action, ex actions that sometimes bug me, and so for me it was more like taking the label off who he is, he's selfish, and moving it to like, he does selfish things mm -hmm. sometimes. Right. And that kind of it's a great way of looking at it. And then not taking it personal, yeah. right? Realizing that that's just part of who he is. That I mean, there's certain, there's ways that you can set a great example and help him, but you're not, you're not going to be able to change him, no. right? He can only change himself. So realizing that there's things he's dealing with that are, you know, pro, you know, they're they're promoting that attitude within him, you know, and you can take it as it is, and you can look. At, I love the way you're looking at it. Absolutely. Yeah, just shifting that thought has it made a difference. Or did you just think about this? Just yeah, now? He's, I feel like he's actually getting less selfish now as well. Okay. So you're thinking about so it. It, it, it goes back to show you how powerful our thoughts are. Like we know they're powerful, but we don't actually real how, realize how powerful until we start thinking about these examples. And you know, oftentimes it's our attachments, our attachment to these thoughts, and believing that these thoughts are true without any proof. And like we mentioned earlier, sometimes the attachment to these thoughts happened years ago, and we haven't let that go yet. Yeah. Where's that orange? Do we have that orange out there? You're finished with the orange, right? Oh, well, we still got some more questions. Oh, okay. You want to go first? Yeah. Go for it. I, well, I was just going to say, one thing that's great, another great thing about having people who hold you accountable, so they know you well. So as an example, I can say to myself, oh, Connor, you really need to step back with people and think about things, and et cetera, and meditate. But I am so extroverted that if I actually do that for too long, it's a real problem, actually. Like, it's like, it, and, and I might not notice. I might be like, oh, yes, this is a good thing. I've like, removed myself. And he'll be like, you really need to go out and hang out with some people. <laughs> because, because it's so noticeable, like, because it's actually a form of isolating myself, right? And, but, you know, I, you, you wouldn't necessarily notice that on your own. So having people in your life that are calling you or, or that know you well, um, I think, can really help you get out of your ruts, right? Totally agree. Yeah, having a great support system, no question. Did you have any... I was, yeah, what you're talking about with the morning routine, like getting up early and things like that, and I have heard, I've heard that from so many people that that's so helpful, and I cannot get out of bed. Like, I am like... <laughs> I, feel, I felt this way, like I would give up like my entire career for 10 more minutes, you know, like, like snooze button. You know? I have this terrible habit of doing, I've done that my whole life, and I just don't know how to overcome this. Like, I, I would almost say, accept that, that's okay, that's who you are. Maybe your calming period needs to be an hour before you go to bed. Maybe that's the time where you can do some self-care. That's the time that it's quiet. That's the time where there's no TV, no electronics. So you may not have to necessarily fight that. If you know that's not you, then don't fight it. Yeah, go with your strengths. Without a doubt, there, there are people who are night owls, period. But you can, you can, you can perform that mindfulness-based practice in the evening, that self-care practice, 
and maybe even like set yourself up so when you wake up in the morning, you, you kind of know what you have to do. Like you, you have some of that, those first few tasks are lined up, and so you're not waking up, you know, like we were checking our cell phones first thing. Just to get your morning a little bit structured so that you're still starting your morning, even if it's a little later, on the right foot. Hey, Mark and Angel, with the next minute or so, can you tell us why you're holding an orange? Okay, so <laughs> we'll finish with this. I'm kind of good as on holding the pit, too. <laughs> Um, if you guys were on the webinar, we did a webinar for Simple Red, uh, we, we mentioned the orange story. So, so we'll gloss and orange, so we figured we have to do it. So we'll do, we'll do the orange story again. So if I were to squeeze this orange, what would come out of it? Juice. 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 What kind of juice? Grapefruit juice? Orange juice. Orange juice. Apple juice? No. Definitely. Orange juice. Why would orange juice come out of this orange? Because it's an orange. Because <laughs> it's an orange and that's what's inside, right? Okay. Now, imagine this orange isn't an orange, but it's you. And imagine that somebody squeezes you. Someone puts pressure on you. Someone says something that you don't like. And out of you comes anger, resentment, fear. Why? Well, as you've just said, it's because that's what's inside. So when someone says something about you you don't like and someone puts a pressure on you, regardless of who, who's doing it, who's doing the squeezing, whether it's your mom, your work, your children, the government, whoever's doing the squeezing, whatever is coming out is because that's what's inside. And what's inside is up to you. It's your choice on what you have inside what you put inside, what you let inside. So if anything's coming out, anything's coming out other than love, then it's time to start removing those negative things. And once you replace those negative thoughts, those negative things, replace them with love, then you'll find yourself in a much happier, simpler place. Let me challenge you to use a self-inquiry process as that tool. You really do. So. All right, thank you. Yeah.